Welcome back to Race Talk Show. This is your host, Ray Coyasso. Thank you so much for joining us. Race Talk Show, the Latino political podcast that br- brings the perspective of the Latino community in underserved populations, typically the voiceless in our society, including the voices of the millions of young people that had their voice heard. Um, and uh, this week in our national political conversation, and unfortunately, including those uh, the, the victims in Austin, Texas, of the bombings, um, oftentimes people that, that are the victims of violence day to day in our society that don't get the same headlines. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, you can catch Ray's Talk Show anywhere you download a podcast, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, SoundCloud, YouTube, the list goes on and on. Uh, check us out on social media, on Twitter, at Ray's Podcast, and Instagram, at Ray's Latino Talk. Uh, thank you again for joining me. And again, this week, after a brief hiatus, I guess he's, you know, as uh, Cardi B would say, he was too busy making money moves. My dear Dominican compadre and uh, a fantastic activist and thinker in his own right, Albert Garcia, as Cotty used to say, welcome back, dude. Who like you? Check it out. Welcome back, brother. Great to be back. Great to be back, Ray. So for those very diehard race talk show listeners, you'll know that uh, Albert Garcia is uh, originally from Washington Heights, but now lives in South Florida with his wonderful family. So we're going to get the latest on the ground take, uh, what's happening and the feeling of the Miami area residents of this latest tragedy, this this bridge collapse that just happened hours ago. Later in the show, we're going to hear from a consumer financial protection activist, a Latina leader, one of the top uh, policy experts in that in that field, Marisa Bel Torres, who's going to give us the latest update in Washington, D.C. Albert Dodd-Frank is under attack. So we need to fight back and um, consumer financial protections, which have huge impacts on our community from a housing perspective and from a wealth building perspective. Uh, there's some things going on um, that are happening, unfortunately, very much under the radar that Marisa Bell is going to catch us up on. And we, and then later in the show, Albert and I are going to give you our analysis of the of uh, what the Pennsylvania con- special uh, congressional race uh, victory for Democrat candidate Connor Lamb means for our politics and how that relates to sort of the Latino vote in 2018. And again, we'll, uh, we'll have some time at the end of the show uh, to give people um, uh, some, we have some rest in peace and some folks we have to acknowledge that uh, we lost, unfortunately, this week and deserve a few moments of our time. But first, Albert, let's start with what just happened. So hours ago, for folks that didn't see, a newly installed bridge, um, pedestrian bridge, on the campus of Florida International University in the Miami area, collapsed it was just open days ago unfortunately killing um at least four people and injuring many others We're st- it's still unclear because unfortunately there's there's cars still pinned uh, the extent of the of the damage but albert um, first of all i'm glad to hear brother you weren't near the scene i was not i was not it's uh you know i was i was hanging out in, in the north part of the city this is more towards the south um you know in uh in kind of in kendall heading and then heading in some ways on way to, to to homestead so um Usually a very high traffic area. Um, I mean, very folks, I think the situation is very lucky in that it happened at like 2 o'clock in the afternoon, so before really the rush hour kind of starts. Um, I mean, the, the construction had been completed a couple of days ago. They hadn't yet cut the ribbon open, and FIU was, um, you know, the students are on spring break. Um, so thankfully, thankfully um, there wasn't a lot of people necessarily using the, the actual bridge, and, and again, because of the time, um, all you all you had cars going underneath it, um, it wasn't a situation where, um, where it was rush hour, right? And so in, in some ways, this could have been a lot worse. I think the, the other thing that people are kind of thanking itself is that, you know, um, the site is very near um, the site of the Miami Dade Youth Fair. Um, and, so, um, and so having this actually happen, I mean, it's going to delay the youth fair a little bit um, until the opening, but everyone's kind of very thankful that it didn't happen while the youth fair was going on, because certainly would have had a lot of people um, in terms of attending that, um, as well as because in many parts of Miami-Dade, um, you know, the end of the month really signifies the, the, the school break, you know, the spring break for, for kids, right? So, um, again, lucky into that situation, the heart goes out, um, you know, to, to those who were impacted by it. Um, and again, this is, you know, this is, you know, FIU is, you know, an historically, you know, an historically Hispanic serving um you know, or a co- you know, university. It's got. 60, I think the, if I remember right, looking at the demographics, like 61% um, 
Hispanic, or Latino. Including, Latin, including besides the Latino you know, population, including many of our friends, uh, Alex Easdale, Mike Hernandez, so many of our friends have gone through that university, but also at one point, and they're probably still similar, at one point was the largest, the institution had the most uh, Puerto Ricans from the island uh, in the mainland United States. So, a, especially an important institution for the Puerto Rican community in Florida. Oh no, definitely, and, and they did a lot of they did a lot of work um, in coming, you know, helping students both who had been impacted by Hurricane Maria and Irma, um, but also to open their doors to, to facilitate folks from the island to come and attend classes and stuff. So and the sad so thing is, this was an urban this was an urban planning project that you would appreciate, LB, with your urban planning background. That they were trying to, you know, from like a you know pedestrian conscious tr- gridlock. Again, you were saying, and I know Senator Ruby even said earlier, this is one of the most you know, one of the one of the densest intersections in the Miami area. They were trying to do the right thing: have a pedestrian walkway, make it safer, make it more environmentally friendly. Campus that campus and that university have exploded in influence and in um, in in scope over the last several years. They have a law school now. They have Division One sports programs, and so it's just such a shame. So again, much respect and LB. I'm just glad that you and the family are safe, and uh, we're going to continue to monitor. You know what happened? Obviously, there was people on campus that. It like you said, it hadn't even, the ribbon hadn't been been cut, so some people didn't, didn't even realize that it was even open for business yet. So there's many questions that have to be answered. Um, but again, our friends at FIU, Lo Siento, you know, we're with you all the way, and uh, again, our best to the family. You know, our, our deepest sympathies to the families impacted by this uh, this great tragedy. Albert, you know, you guys have been in the center of so many things. Um, of course, uh, just uh, yesterday there was a national school walkout. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of students around the country, walked out, including many that went to the halls of Congress uh, yest- uh, yesterday to protest and just have their voice heard as millennial generation, the Z generation, um, in these gun control debates. Uh, LB, we've had some movement in Florida, and I wanted to get your take on on that. Governor Rick Scott um, signed into law the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School Public Safety Act. This, the, the state law now in Florida is going to bar most uh, or at least many people under 21 from buying guns completely, mandate a three-day waiting period, um, ban bump stocks, uh, and potentially arm some school personnel. Um, so, Albert, you know, there's so much here. I mean, I know, first of all, what the young people that are taking the lead on this, including uh, one of our great uh, great leaders, Emma Gonzalez, my, for my money, probably the most influ- important Latino leader in the United States right now, um, and many others, David Hogg and all those great young people, um, have done it really draws a contrast between the established democratic or progressive leadership in this country which is led by almost octogenarians like joseph biden and, and bernie sanders and, and nancy pelosi and and literally the great grandchildren of that generation um who are really leading or, or taking so much leadership in our country right now yeah no i mean i think it, it, it's great to see that i think the other thing that that um, I mean, the truth of the matter is that, that gun violence, you know, is, um, you know, is, is a problem in many, um, in many schools and many ur- urban areas around, you know, both the, around the state as well as around the country. And, and, and certainly here in, in South Florida, there has been a lot of activity, um, you know, led by, by, you know, black and Latinx, you know, kids in their schools, right? And so I think when Parkland kind of shone a light on that, I think, you know, a lot of props to those Parkland students, they've been not only traveling around the country, but also traveling within South Florida, right? I mean, there was a, you know, Parkland students, for example, went to Liberty, you know, Liberty Square Community Center, which is in the heart of Liberty City, um, an African-American um, institution that has seen a lot of gun violence um, escalating in the last couple of years. You know, King Carter, who was, you know, five years old, I think, if I remember right, or, or and, and again, numerous kind of young children kind of caught in the crossfire. So. And they had, you know, they went down with a bunch of other kids from one of those schools and, like, and had a discussion, a forum that they let. All the adults didn't speak. Um, they let the kids, you know, they, they let these, these young folks speak and they also ran the meeting. Um, I think it's been very inspirational for a lot of folks who do organizing work in these communities and, and work in nonprofits to see them step up. Um, but in so many ways, and, and their activism even led something to be done at all, right? Because in many ways, um, Florida and the Florida legislature is, um, you know, the testing hotbed for the NRA. Like things that they mm-hmm. want to test nationally, they first start and see if they can pass them in Florida, including, you know, like stand your ground, right? It first passed you know, in terms of here, um, and they use it as a computer around the country. And so to see any kind of movement um, for gun control, 
um, in this bill, um, especially in terms of the, 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 the raising of the age from 18 to, to 21 for, for some of these um, assault weapons, um, you know, was, uh, you know, certainly a victory, right? What wasn't a victory was, um, you know, the inclusion of money that would arm um, some school personnel, right? And, and that's what, in many ways, I think that's what a lot of the, the students and young people have talked about, um, especially because they don't want their schools to be transformed into kind of copycat mini prisons with folks walking around with guns. Um, and, and there's a power dynamic in any kind of school or classroom between teachers and school safety personnel and folks there. Um, and again, listening to students yesterday, people talked about, you know, like, you know, you know, can I really feel free to voice, you know, one woman, one young lady said, you know, can I really feel free to voice my opinion if I know that my teacher in that classroom, you know, has a gun, right? Or someone near the state has a gun. And we also saw, I mean, while there were a lot of people who walked out across the nation um, in Miami-Dade, um, you know, the school superintendent didn't give permission for that, right? And although the ACLU, you know, says that, that students should be able to walk out without getting suspensions and stuff, there were a lot of folks who didn't make it outside their school. They just walked out into the, you know, their, their yard or, their, you know, inside or, or, like, the main section, you know, the outside section outside. Um, and, again, you know, reporters being on the outside, folks being on the inside, um, and not being able to go out or being intimidated in some places because, um, because cops were outside schools, right? Um, and and, and not, folks not feeling that. And so, in some ways, it's also, I think, put greater attention on the environment and the different kind of learning environments that there are for schools and for students, right? And in some ways, this, the, this, the difference between, um, you know, some students in some schools um, and, some sc and some students in other schools in terms of their ability to be able to be, like, civically active and civically engaged. Um, and, and it brings up into the question of, like, really in terms of these schools, what are we teaching kids um, in terms of civics? And what are we also teaching them about activism Especially if we potentially, you know, have a situation where, um, you know, there's armed personnel. Um, and so, there's, there's, you know, a program that's called the Marshall Program was given $67 million. A lot of um, folks, both including the Miami-Dade um, superintendent and the Broward County superintendent, Broward County specifically, which includes, like, Fort Lauderdale and includes the area of the, of the Parkland School, um, they talked about how, you know, this, the money for this program and, and for the mental health um, counselors um, that people want in terms of increased counseling comes out, you know, it, it came out of, you know, existing monies and in fact it even came out of the state housing fund, right? And so the question becomes, yes, you're, you're potentially arming um, folks and potentially making schools in your mind more secure, but are you actually adding to the learning environment? Are you giving schools and neighborhoods the resources uh, to actually create an environment where kids not just feel safe, but it can also succeed and explore and talk about those things. And so, um, you know, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're definitely, from, from activists to, to school personnel and education um, advocates, there's this real question of, of, of what are you really kind of doing um, when you also um, pay, you know, shift this amount of money into what is basically a law enforcement situation on campus. Are you actually doing anything about shooting um, and, and well, those things? I well, think from, yeah, from, the, from, from the accident in California where the teacher who was there to uh, who had a weapon on him because I guess he teaches gun safety through the ROTC program on, on school. The, the gun goes off. There's shrapnel that that injures three kids and they're never even sent home <laughs> or there's never even first responders sent to the kids. Um, and so uh, the guy kept teaching uh, for Christ's sakes. And by the way, the only student identified was a spanish surname so off wonder if this you know if this guy was uh potentially teaching in the inner city of california uh i guess you know uh, where those kids have been treated different if they had different last names but my point is that you know the bottom line is that this is such a ridiculous concept um having you know weapons just more weapons just cause more violence you're gonna be, there's gonna be more you know there's a better chance that you're gonna get hurt a gun owner or someone with a gun on them or someone in their home or someone a gun in their school, there's more likely there's going to be an accident with that gun than you'd be hurt by an intruder or um, or someone attacking your school. And the reason that the police who already had a, uh, an officer assigned to that school, the re I mean, you know, you can spe I'm speculating here, but most likely the reason that man didn't, that police officer didn't go into that, that building is because he knew he was outgunned. 
And the reason he was outgunned is we're allowing people to have automatic weapons in our society. And that wasn't the case 25 years ago, and it changed. Um, and, you know, and that has fundamentally changed the dynamic of this power dynamic, you know, with the police and, and, the, and these perpetrators in our society. So, um, you know, while on some level, you know, we have to be happy that it's certainly a, a victory for us, uh, uh, particularly with a very conservative legislature and Governor Scott and, and a very powerful Florida-based NRA lobby, um, the fact that this is opening the door for more guns in Florida schools, which are already on high alert, um, and the tensions there and, and the gun culture of the state. So we have to be very diligent and continue to move forward. Um, the other thing is that we've got to, whether it's Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, on some level, even our generation, we got to get the hell out of the way, LB, and let these young people do their thing. I mean, well, I, and, you know. Yeah, and, and I will say this. I mean, I, I think, you know, I think there's, it's, it's interesting, right? Because I think we certainly have to get out the way. But we also have to, I, I think it's also important for us to also know our role in terms of being able, you know, to give folks the mentorship and the resources that they need, right? Because I think, you know, one of the things that, that, that has caught my attention, certainly when you listen to young folks mm-hmm. talking about this issue and talking about things and way to do that, is that, like, they're not necessarily thinking that they can do this all by themselves, right? Mm-hmm. I think that's what's actually interesting when you compare their responses to that, like, to that of, like, older folks in terms of their, and so I think you're right, I think, you know, but, but they're also, they also understand that, like, they also want to hear from people who are doing things, right? They want to hear also, um, you know, especially, you know, you know the, the folks, the, the, the students at Parkland, in some ways, I mean, they had, you know, this past November engaged in a lot of the classes in their annual debate, or, or like, it was a part of the curriculum, so guns just happened to be about um, being discussed in terms of last fall. And so a lot of these kids are, are, are you know, for those who are wondering, well, why are these kids so well, well-versed in statistics and all these type of other stuff, these kids, you know, this was part of their education, right? This was part of, like, their debate in terms of internally in schools and stuff like that, and, and, and the teachers having set that up. Um, but how many of our schools still have those kind of programs, right? How many of those kids are actually getting that information? And in general, how many of our kids are, you know, lucky enough to also have curriculums and textbooks that are up to date and ability to kind of listen and, and tell fake news versus others and being analytical. Students, when you listen to them, they want to know that stuff too, right? And they also want to know what's their, how do they hold these, um, how do they hold these elected officials accountable, right, for what they want to do? And so you've seen an upsurge really in the last two weeks. Um, and I've seen it in a bunch of different schools um, in terms of kids, um, you know, students, registering to vote not only those people are 18 in florida i'm not sure in terms of pennsylvania other parts of the country but in florida you can pre-register to vote so kids as, as early as 16 can actually fill out um a voter registration form yeah, right and it won't be activated 18. until they're 18 but they actually can do that right which is something that is, is amazing when you think about it, and you've got a lot of kids saying okay i'm going to definitely do that i'm going to be involved and you've had tons of kids also just sign up you know in different kind of you know not profits and social and organizations saying hey this summer i want to make sure that that I'm, I'm i'm coming out and getting folks also engaged and to me i think that's i think that's inspirational um it's inspirational for a lot of also folks down here in florida because i think you know we you know very like the generations are different like i remember you know growing up in not so long ago i guess right like in the 80s and stuff and you still had like people um talking about stuff but you still had like on college campuses and high schools you had you know, you had divestment, like South Africa divestment campaign. I mean, New York City, you still had folks actually protesting against, like, you know, cuts and, you know, into school aid and things like that. And, and, and you had immigrant communities taking to the streets, taking to the school boards. Some of that stuff isn't seen as much nowadays, maybe in the last couple of years because of Trump it has. Um, but, but students down here, too, I mean, like, so, so often we tell kids to be, you know, that they're the next generation and that they have to step up. And yet we also tell them that children should be seen and not heard, right? right. And, and, and then it's not just yeah. like mainstream institutions. We do that sometimes in terms of culturally too, right? In terms of folks in terms of doing that and, and wanting to do that. And so um, you've seen a lot of think discussions um, in smaller circle here about like what are we actually, what what are we, what are the skills that we are transferring to our youth so that they can, you know, be the change that not only that we want them to be, but that they themselves want them. And learning goes both ways, right? Because th- this generation, and particularly this leadership that's bubbled up from the, the latest uh, shooting at Parkland, um, is teaching us, I think, how to sort of navigate 
social media uh, debates, right? Like, you know, they're, they're the best people that combat trollers I've ever seen. And that gives us some models. And, and the other part is, and you alluded to, you spoke about this earlier, is this concept, how good, how cognizant they are of intersectionality. And I don't know the young man's name. I'm sorry, but um, I'll put it in the, in the show notes. But there was a young man, a white male who I had not seen yet, who's part of the Parkland group, who spoke in Washington that spoke specifically about the fact that within this in movement, we have to uh, we have to specifically address the fact that African American and Latino youth are disproportionately impacted by this issue, not only as victims, but as part of the mass incarceration issues that we have in our community. And you're listening to Elber Garcia, uh, my dear Domenico compadre, and um, uh, I don't think his family came uh, over as great mountain climbers as Donald Trump alluded to, and we're going to talk about that in a second. I think it was probably Pan Am um, or Delta, um, and uh, uh, and we're talking about the issues you're talking about um, that are impacting us. And uh, let's now hear from uh, a great advocate related to, um, in the field of consumer financial protections, Marisa Bel Torres. That's going to give us the latest of what's happening, the attempts by the Republicans, and unfortunately, a few Democrats that have that have vote, been voting for it in the Senate the last few weeks um, to dilute the Dodd Frank um, law and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, and we'll come back and continue our conversation with Elba Garcia here on Race Talk Show. Welcome back to Race Talk Show. You know, this is a guest that's um, a great colleague of mine, and uh, considering there's issues with everything going on in our world, issues like uh, issues like consumer financial protection often don't get a lot of attention in the mainstream media, and so, but they have a big impact in our community, so that's why I wanted to bring on a great friend to the show and colleague, um, the senior policy analyst of the Wealth Building Initiative for Unidos U.S. and the public uh, and the author of the study "Banking in Color: New Findings and Financial Access for Lower and Moderate Income Communities." Marisa Bel Torres, uh, Marisa Bel, welcome finally to Race Talk Show. Hello, thanks for having me, Marisa Bel. You uh, you are when I think about issues concerning the Latino community and working people, people of color, as it relates to consumer financial protections. I think of you. So who better to discuss what's happening? <laughs> These are issues that I know for many of you, we're going to get into names, acronyms, and concepts that are can sound a little overwhelming, a little intimidating, but that's why we have Marisa Bel Torres here. Marisa Bell, I want to have you on the show this week on Race Talk Show because there's a couple things that are happening, which you're following very closely, that, uh, that, that really impact our community. The first one I wanted to talk to you about is there's an attack now going on in Congress about weakening... Uh, Dodd Frank, which was a le- a comprehensive piece of consumer financial protection legislation, banking legislation that was passed during the Obama years. So, before we get into what's happening in Congress this week and what's been happening that you're monitoring, why don't we start with what is what was um, and what is the Dodd Frank uh, law um, that were uh, that was uh, put that was passed in the law during the Obama years? Sure. So, um, you know, the way that Congress is acting, you would think that this happened um, many, many, many years, maybe decades ago. But really, this all has just taken place for the last 10 years. Um, so essentially, in 2008, we marked the anniversary of, um, or that would, we call it the start of the, the recession and the housing crisis and all of the fallout that came from there, which a lot of communities are still recovering from. Um, but as a result of the market crash, uh, the foreclosure crisis, we did get a piece of legislation called the Dodd-Frank Act, uh, Wall Street Reform Act. A lot of people shorthand it to either Dodd-Frank or just Wall Street Reform. Um, but what that really essentially was saying was to the American public, uh, we know that what has happened was unprecedented. The way that financial markets were behaving, the way that financial actors were able to interact with with consumers, with everyday people, was not okay. There was a lot of predatory lending. Um, people that had, um, you know, should have had better terms on their mortgages, people that should have had better access to better credit, uh, were not given that access and were given really bad terms for loans. Um, and that was because they were, they were allowed to get away with it. Wall Street really um, did not have a whole lot of rules that they were adhering to. There were some rules on the books. There were some, you know, agencies that were supposed to be looking out for the everyday consumer, and that really wasn't happening. Um, if you've seen the movie, you know, Wolf of Wall Street, or if you've seen um, The Big Short, you know, those actually do pretty good jobs of depicting, you know, some of what was going on. Um, so essentially what we got from Dodd Frank was uh, an agency, the newest federal agency on the block here in D.C., 
the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. And the number one mission of this agency was to look out for the everyday person, to look out for consumers, to make sure that we would have rules in place that would not um, allow financial firms, um, you know, big, big banks to treat people the way that they had been treating. Essentially, um, you know, being okay with predatory lending was not going to be the way of the game anymore. Um, so CFPB is known as a consumer watchdog. And it was the baby uh, of Senator Elizabeth Warren before she uh, moved into the Senate. Um, you know, she came up with the idea of an agency that really would do just that, look out for everyday consumers. Um, and so that agency was created under Dodd-Frank. And right now, unfortunately, as I said a little bit earlier, you would think that this was a long time ago, but it's only been 10 years. Um, and already the agency has been essentially had its doors open for about six years. It took a little bit of time to, to get everything in place. Um, and in that time, it's returned billions of dollars to consumers who have been found to be victims of financial abuse in the market, whether it's through predatory credit, um, you know, mortgage, auto lending. Uh, you know, a lot of bad actors out there have actually been told that's not okay and you actually owe money back to consumers who have been harmed. And that's because of this agency. In only six years, it's been able to return literally billions of dollars to the hands of consumers. Um, and unfortunately, right now with, with the new administration and the way that uh, Congress has been, been moving in this direction of really giving concessions back to Wall Street. Um, so there are a number of attempts to weaken Dodd-Frank and to weaken those rules that were so necessary, again, as a result of the recession, the market crash, where Latino families themselves lost 60% of wealth uh, as a result mm. of the recession and the foreclosure crisis. Um, so unfortunately, there is a desire in Congress right now uh, to roll back a lot of these protections. And so we are fighting to the nail right now um, to make sure that we can hold on to as many recessions as possible and to stop this rollback of Dodd-Frank. So, so people understand kind of thinking about our day-to-day -day lives. So think about over the last 10 years, whether it's your, you, your cousin, your neighbor, someone in your family, someone in your network, probably, unfortunately, many people in your network, if not yourself personally, were impacted by you know, the, the, the mortgage crisis, you know, so people that were, that were given uh, subprime mortgage loans many years ago. And, and f at some point relatively quickly in, in owning a home realized that, you know, this was not a good deal for them and they were preyed upon. Think about payday lending. Think about how many of us, um, you know, because we don't have access to, 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 to credit or, 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 you know, credit with reasonable rates you know, have our lives ruined, some of us, um, too many of us, by, you know, pr payday loans. And, and there's a reason why around tax time, you see one of these payday loans, if you're living in Las Vegas or parts of Texas or part of Florida, where you see these payday shops on every corner in our community. Um, so these are the kind of uh, issues that affected everybody, really impact us, in that this, this uh, watchdog agency under the Obama administration and partially under the leadership of now Senator Warren, um, uh, was was created. And as Marisa Beltora said, this has returned billions of dollars to our community. It is now sort of, you know, uh, slowed down the loss of wealth in our community. So now turning into the Trump administration, um, uh, they're looking to weaken these laws. So uh, Marisa Bell, share with people exactly sort of what uh, legislation is being considered or the legislation is being considered in Congress now would harm um, uh, weaken Dodd-Frank and the CFPB and Share with people the fact that this is not just uh, an issue now we're dealing with with the Republicans because, unfortunately, with the first round of voting um, that took place in the Senate, many senators, many of which are helpful to us on many other issues on the Democratic side, voted for it in its initial version. Yep. So right now there is a bill in the Senate, um, Senate Bill 2155, which is called, um, a little deceivingly, <laughs> Economic Growth Regulatory Relief and Consumer Protection Act. Uh, what this essentially is doing is loosening the scrutiny that under Dodd-Frank was given to CPB um, over banks. So what this, um, the heart of it is really saying that if you are a bank and you have less than $250 billion worth of assets, you should no longer be under the purview of Dodd-Frank. You should no longer have to adhere to those rules that were put in place. Now, let me tell you where the threshold for assets currently is for banks. Right now, any bank that has $50 billion, at least $50 billion in assets, is now under under scrutiny from Dodd-Frank. You have to play by the rules. So they want to raise that from $50 billion 
to $250 billion. And what that does in real talk is <laughs> it would then um, relieve 25 of the world's 38 largest banks from this scrutiny under Dodd-Frank. So it was really sold as a way of making sure that, quote-unquote, community banks were not having um, too much of a regulatory burden, that they didn't have too much to comply with because they were the little guys. They shouldn't have to play by the same rules as the really big guys. And, you know, sometimes that makes sense, but when you're talking about literally billions and billions of dollars, you know, at what point are you no longer a quote-unquote small community bank? Um, you know, they're really trying to sell it as it's for the mom and pop shops, so we're really talking about some of the largest banks in the world. Um, another category of banks that we refer to are called stadium banks. And the reason I refer to that to that way is because when you think about when you go to a stadium, you go to a sports game, um, is the stadium named after a bank? <laughs> if it is, then that bank is then, you know, large enough to have a stadium named after it. So you're, you're not one of the little guys. That's right. um, and so that's who, who regulators are trying to sell this, or sorry, legislators, we're trying to sell this as that's, that's who we want to make sure is covered under off rank, not the little guys. Now, going back to to the, the, the mortgage crash, the foreclosure crash, uh, crisis, one of the banks um, that, you know, really had a large part in this was called Countrywide Financial. It was a huge subprime mortgage lender at the time um, of the 2008 mortgage crisis. At the time of that crisis, they had assets totaling $210 billion. So if we were to listen to what this new piece of legislation, 2155, was saying, it would say that banks like Countrywide should not be under this, you know, extra scrutiny from Dodd-Frank. Um, clearly, <laughs> Countrywide was doing horrible things and should be under the purview of, of someone like the CCB and, and legislation like Dodd-Frank, um, this, you know, this bill, if enacted, would then remove them from, from having to adhere to those kinds of rules. So that could be potentially very, very harm, uh, harmful to, to your everyday consumer. And again, it's supposed to be sold as, you know, just relief community banks, um, which we get, sure. But when we're talking, you know, a difference between $50 billion and $250 billion, you're really not talking about a small mom and pop shop. And we're, we're talking to Marisa Bel Torres from the uh, Senior Policy Analyst for the Wealth Building Initiative of Unidos U.S. And for my money, one of the top um, Latina or Latinx, Latino, however uh, you want to refer to it, um, as a um, uh, sort of consumer financial protection analyst that we have in our community. So really proud to have Marisa Bell and a great friend to the show as well on the show. Um, Marisa Bell, the other part of this that I'm that I'm starting to learn about, which is really concerning, is the other part of the legislation that sort of, or the other part of the scrutiny or part of the regulations that would be relieved of many of these major financial institutions would be the tracking that they're now required to do um, that monitor how they're uh, they're 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 approaching their customers of color. So you know this concept of making sure that um, you know that they're not sort of. Uh, either redlining or you know doing other practices that discriminate against um, their customers when it comes to access to credit, access to mortgages, and just other financial yeah. products. So, can you talk about the the provisions uh, that that are in place now that are under attack that that are uh, and and how they've benefited us over the last several years? Yes. So, uh, what you're referring to is um, essentially um, what Dodd Frank is requiring. Um, lenders to do is to report their mortgage lending activities uh, under what we call the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, which is called HUMDA for short. And this really is the tool that we have that can ensure that we can hold lenders accountable for how they are treating, just as you said, how are they they're actually lending to communities of color. Um, under Dodd-Frank originally, all institutions, uh, Dodd-Frank required all institutions that originated at, you know, just 25 home loans to report to Humda data. So if you were doing at least 25, um, you know, home loans in, in part of your portfolio, you had to report. You had to say, you know, uh, what was the credit um, of these people, you know, so you could make sure that people uh, were not getting discriminated against. You know, what we found um, in the aftermath of the recession was that, you know, African-American families, Latino families who had really good credit were getting terrible, terrible uh, lending terms when you compared them to white peers of theirs who had the exact same credit. So the, really it was just a lot of racial discrimination going on um, and we were not able to capture that before. So under Dodd-Frank, under Humda, um, you know, banks are, our mortgage lenders are required to report that activity again so that we have something to hold them accountable to, to how they're treating our, our communities. Um, so now, 
what this uh, legislation would do would exempt um, banks that originate less than 500 open-ended and 500 closed-ended mortgages. Um, so again, we originally started with 25 with the threshold. If you, if you hit 25, you need to report. Now they're saying, let's move that up to 500. <laughs> so what that means in real terms was uh, approximately 37 uh, 100 depository institutions or 66% of all banks would then be exempt from the requirements to collect and report that HMDA data, um, which would be very, very problematic. Again, this is one of the strongest tools we have to make sure that our communities are being treated fairly, that we do have that opportunity to become homeowners, which is the, you know one of the strongest ways that people have to transfer wealth from one generation to the next is through the home. Um, you know that's, that's how a lot of families do manage to get ahead from one generation to the next. And if we're not being treated fairly, strictly based on racial, uh, you know, uh, preferences, then that's not okay. And we need laws in place to make sure that banks are adhering to that and that they're not allowed to get away with that. Um, so Hamda is under attack, and it would really be harder for us to determine how lenders were serving with the you know, credit needs, um, and again, to identify any discriminatory lending patterns. So we really need to have access to this mortgage lending information, and it becomes uh, very, very critical for us to make sure that we're able to address any inequities and, and discriminatory lending practices that are happening in the market. So, Marisabel, let me ask you a question. You may not have an answer for it, but I, I just, I'm trying to understand. You know, you're, you're talking about, and we haven't even gotten to the, the attempt to weaken the CFPB, which we're going to talk about in a second. That's another piece of legislation. But what, then why did all these de- these Democratic senators... I mean, I have my guesses, but I'm curious. I mean, what, what's your sense of why many of them, the, the, the Tim Kaines and many others that, again, we work with on a lot of other issues, why did they vote for this bill um, in its initial version? <laughs> you know, I wish, I wish I was a fly on the wall <laughs> during some of these conversations. Um, you know, I can only say it's, it's been really disappointing because, as you said, some of these have been friends of ours on, on other very important pieces of legislation. We think that they get it. Um, you know, again, I think that this, this legislation was sold as a bipartisan effort, you know, to, to make sure that we're not hurting people's access to credit because those small community banks, small banks are able to lend and not have the same regulatory burdens that are costly for them. Um, so I, you know, I would guess that maybe some of them do believe that they will actually be giving some sort of relief um, to the smaller players, but um, it's, you know, I feel like the, the evidence is clear that that's really going to be doing way more harm to people um, than, than getting anything positive out of this legislation. And, it, you know, Tim Kaine especially is, is hurtful for me because I Virginia is my home state. <laughs> so yeah. He and Warner, actually, Senator Warner as well, are both um, part of the, the Democrats who, who are not uh, looking like they're on the right side of this, of this conversation right now. Um, so it's, you know, there's always horse trading that goes on behind the scenes. I'm not really sure what they're going to get out of this one, though. Well, you know, and I've heard other progressives talk about, I mean, including you, like Senator Warren and Senator Sanders. I mean, they're, they're, their colleagues, or many of their colleagues are not happy with them. And, uh, and, and one of the things that's so frustrating in this process is it just never seems like when the Democrats sort of play ball, whether it's voting, you know, to, for, for cloture on the budget or anything else, they never seem to get anything out of it. And, and you just, Uh-oh. you just have this sense that they could be, they, <laughs> I'll tell you, I wouldn't want to go to Vegas, um, and play poker with these folks. <laughs> Uh, and again, you're listening to Marisa Bel Torres of Unidos U.S. Uh, breaking down some of the consumer financial protection attacks in our community. Um, before we get into what we can do about it, Marisa Bell, because I'm sure you have some thoughts on that. Uh, the CFPB, again, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, there's yet another proposal that's being circulated in Washington. I saw earlier today um, that it, there may be a, a Senate bill released as early as this week um, that uh, another measure that would further weaken the power and the and the influence of the CFPB as it relates to its management uh, structure. Yes. Um, so this is just one attempt that we're talking about. There are actually a couple. So what you're referring to was um, a bill that would change the entire structure of the agency, which currently is headed by a director. Um, so there's one director, and he's in charge of the entire agency, which has a number of offices and divisions. Um, so that would change the structure from that you know, which is, uh, you know, not unheard of uh, to have, you know, a single director for an agency and instead make it a um, commission. 
So essentially you have a number of people who are then in charge of decision making. Um, and just think about the last time that you had to make a decision about, you know, where to go for dinner with a group of friends. How much more effective was it when one person was put in charge <laughs> than it was to have five people in charge of that? Um, so there's, you know, this, this would, we think that would really harm the effectiveness of this agency to leave it up to a commission, you know, a commission that could, you know, be appointed by people um, who might not have the best interest of the agency. Right now there is an act director, so the original director of the agency, Richard Cordray, stepped down from office. His, his term would have expired anyway um, in 2018 in the summertime, but he left a little earlier. He's now running for governor of Ohio. Um, and so then the president um, appointed an acting director, um, and in the meantime, it's supposed to be coming up with a nominee who would then have to go through the full Senate confirmation process. So the acting director of this agency is currently actually doing double duty. He already has a full-time job as the Well, now he's got three jobs, man, three jobs. I didn't know Pompeo was Jamaican. Now he's got like three jobs. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, so this guy, uh, Mick Mulvaney, um, is actually doing double duty as the uh, director, or sorry, the head of the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, um, and also acting director of CFPB right now. And unfortunately, this guy um, has been on record saying that he thought that this is a terrible agency. He didn't really see the point of it. He thought it was a dictatorship, which he has now stepped into. Um, and unfortunately, he's making some real attempts to really weaken the, the agency from the inside out, um, including moving um, their offices around, taking away essentially their teeth, the teeth that they have, the enforcement um, abilities that they have, the supervisory uh, powers that they have over some of these actors. Uh, we, you know, we had a huge win uh, when we got a final payday rule in place. You mentioned how terrible payday rules, the payday loans are. Um, we were able to get a very strong payday rule from the agency. It was years and years in the making. They did a full public comment period. So the industry had ample time to weigh in on this, advocates, consumer advocates, uh, you know, everyday <laughs> regular people who do not, you know, necessarily have an affiliation with any sort of advocacy organization, just, you know, any anyone was able to comment on this. Um, and this was years in the making, and we finally got a rule. And a couple weeks ago, Mick Mulvaney, the acting director, said, you know what, we're going to open that back up. Let's hold our horses on that, uh, which is very disappointing. He also, um, when he was actually in Congress for South Carolina, representing them, um, he got a lot of money from payday lending industries and uh, from payday lending companies. So we know that he has, you know, he has some skin in the game there, um, unfortunately. I will also mention that um, the payday industry has an annual conference coming up, which they are holding at a Trump property outside of Miami uh, later on in April. Uh, so if you want to see how cozy uh, the industry is to this administration, look no further. Yeah, no, and, and Marie Isabel has done a lot of work, uh, taking a lot of leadership in, 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 in the advocacy for the payday rule that's in place or now has been on hold, put on hold. And, uh, you know, look, I mean, I don't have to tell people listening to this uh, the kind of harm that uh, payday, you know, uh, payday loans can have, whether it's on the street level with our immigrants, uh, communities that don't feel like they have access to any sort of credit or don't trust working in any sort of formal uh, banking institutions or just, you know, working people that, you know, just get put in a tough spot and they go online or they go to the local, you know, check cashing place or pawn shop and they have an opportunity to, you know, grab, a, you know, get a few bucks out of desperation and, you know, it, 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 these these debts can spiral out of control. So um, these, uh, and, and look, it, it impacts, the, these concerns that Marisa was laying out impact our community. I mean, we don't have time to get into all the statistics, but, you know, literally the, the housing crisis alone wiped away over half of the wealth of our community. So these these issues impact everybody, but in particular, the Latino community. Marisa Bell, you have a lot on your plate. There's a lot here that we have to deal with. Um, but in terms of this uh, Dodd-Frank, uh, this, this legislation going through the Senate now uh, that would weaken Dodd-Frank and, and, again, roll back a lot of protections that we fought for over the years, what what should people be doing? Who should be, they be reaching out to? And where can they learn more about um, about the initiatives that you're the advocacy you're doing to uh, to block this this kind of harmful legislation? Sure. Well, um, you know, this is still yet to be decided in the Senate, so there's still time to contact um, your members of Congress, your Senate um, offices, and let them know exactly how you feel about the repeal of Dodd-Frank and consumer protections that are very important to our community. So I would encourage you um, to, to 
pick up the phone, to tweet at them. A lot of these, um, you know, offices are actually very active on social media. You can use the hashtag um, Stop the Debt Trap. Um, you can follow Senator Warren's lead. She hashtag um, Bank Lobbyist Act, which is essentially uh, saying that this legislation is really just for bank lobbyists, um, which is, is pretty much what it sounds like. Marisa, um, Bell, besi- Marisa Bell, besides the two Virginia senators, who are a couple other key senators? particularly in states with Latino, you know, significant Latino populations you can think of that would be um, important you know, for us to reach out Doug to. Jones, which was really disappointing for us to see in Alabama, which oh, has had wow. a growing Latino population, and That's he true. just was elected, uh, you know, largely a lot of communities of color were behind him. Well, that would devastate um, that, the African-American community, and, so certainly we should get yep. engaged there, absolutely. That's right. Yeah, and you know, just going back to Tim Kaine, I've got to say, he, you know, he was out on the, on the campaign trail, uh, you know, not too long ago, speaking Spanish and <laughs> talking about how important sí, Honduras, immigrant yes. was to him, um, and yet we see we see him pulling this, and and that's not so great. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so, uh, and where else can they find more information, Marisabel, about this the work you're doing and these issues? Sure. So you can um, actually go to a couple of different websites. You can go to the Unidos U.S. website. Um, we have a blog up there right now that is talking about HUMDA, uh, which, again, is the ability of us to know exactly how mortgage lending is happening in our communities. Um, you can go to ourfinancialsecurity.org, um, which has a lot of uh, advocacy materials available for people. You can also go to stopthedebttrap.org as well. Let me tell you, Marisa Bell, this was your first time on Race Talk Show. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, yeah, and, uh, so much. And uh, we have to keep this conversation going. Let people uh, let people let people know where they can find you on social media to keep the conversation going with you if they have any questions. Sure. If you want to hear more about consumer protections and payday lending, which is a lot of what I talk about, you can find me on Twitter <laughs> at Marisa Bell eighty one M A R I S A B E L eight one. Fantastic. Marisa Bel Torres of uh, Unidos US. Again, thank you so much for all your leadership and advocacy in protecting consumers in this country, and uh, have a great week. Thank you. You too. Thank you, Marisa Bel Torres. Uh, We're going to continue to have her back on the show. You know, Albert, you know, these issues around payday loans and Dodd Frank are so important in our community. And Marisa Bel did want to note that since that interview was taped a few days ago, the Senate actually has passed their version of the repeat of the. of the repeal Dodd Frank bill, which is going to dilute uh, certain elements of the of the of Dodd of the current Dodd Frank legislation that are particularly impact our community. So we're going to continue to monitor it. Now the debate goes to the House, um, and you know that's never a good sign when things go to the House. This current House in Congress. Um, uh, so Albert, uh, I spoke about this a moment ago before we went to Mount Isabel. I was I was actually quoting our President Donald Trump who on a on a, a fundraising trip to California spent a little time down uh, made a run for the border if you will he was in San Diego and was uh, checking out different designs of border walls with this you know again every time Mueller gets closer he finds a way to pick on Latinos to distract people and so uh, he was uh, you know checking out border walls saying Mexico's going to pay for it they're still going to build the wall this nonsense and he even said that um, you know our people are professional mountain climbers but this wall um, we can climb mountains, but you know, a twenty-foot wall is going to make it ninety-nine. Per- it's going to stop ninety-nine percent of illegal entries across the border from Mexico. Again, apparently, he's never he's never heard of the concept of planes or tunnels or ships or visas. Um, uh, so, uh, Albert, um, you know, talk to me here. You know what? My continual stat uh, sta- uh, thought about this has been. He'll never stop doing this. It'll only get worse. It's Puerto Rico today. It's immigrants tomorrow. It's, it'll be Venezuela in six months. He'll be demonizing our community until he's ousted from office because that's all he has. He doesn't offer his, his constituents really anything other than bluster and hatred um, and excuses. So what was your take on the latest publicity stunt uh, in San Diego this week? Well, I mean, look, I think, you know, whenever, you know, there's a publicity stunt like that, you have to see well, what is he avoiding? Right? What is he? What other stuff is he trying to like shift our attention away? Right? We're getting into budget discussions and things like that. People are talking about, you know, his inability. He said he was going to stand up to the NRA, and at the end of the day, he didn't. Right? Um, he said, you know, he didn't do anything into the with Russia, but like, you know, again, we're getting more and more every day about whether or not this. Stuff he didn't is, do anything is, for DACA. You know, he hasn't right. done anything for working people. He's not doing infrastructure. He's, you know, he's. Right. 
He's supporting, uh, you know, he's supporting, he's, he's taking people's health care away, uh, on and on and on. A lot of talk and actually not only no action, that's actually a good thing because when he takes action, it's actually the antithesis of, of what his white working class uh, voters in the industrial north wanted uh, were, were supporting him for. Right, but they're going to continue, those who are hardcore, um, are going to continue to, to vote for him because at the end of the day, they give, he, he gives them some skin in the game, right? Mm-hmm. And he, you know, at least very publicly, um, you know, I, I think a lot of people, and it's interesting because I think, you know, there's, there's a lot to be said about being relevant nowadays, right? And, and, and Trump makes some people feel like they are relevant in the conversation. Right? And, and, they, and they don't, and, and you know, it's sad to, that we've gotten to this situation where folks are not really, you know, people, and again, this is where the Parkland students have been real good at, right? Because they'll call BS, right? They'll say, hey, this doesn't make sense, right? And, and the thing is that if it doesn't make sense to someone young, right, then it, there's really no action to it. It's like, you know, like, you know, I, I tell all the time, like, you know, when watching the news and sometimes my daughter Nadia will be like, well, puppy, I don't understand this, right? And when they're saying that, it's like, if you can't explain it to an eight-year-old or a seven or, or a nine-year-old, then really you got to call it into question. And so I, I think that just in general, um, you know, there is, um, you know, there are folks, you know, that, 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 that's, let's call it what it is. There are certainly folks who want to take, who don't believe that, that communities of color deserve um, to have equal footing in this country. Um, there are certainly folks who don't believe it enough um, because of whether they feel like folks are like taking in terms of entitled stuff to their way or they're just so used to being on top, right? Um, and, and the truth is that um, there is still, for all the advances folks have made, both individ- individually and, 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 you know, and as a group, um, there are still elements. I mean, there are, you know, there's, you know, reports still about how the banking you know, industry in the years before the Great Recession, you know, discriminated against and continues to discriminate against folks of color and using race um, as a way of discrimination when it comes to mortgages and, and other kind of loan and other kind of loans, right? Um, that their redlining is still going on, even though everyone agrees that that is some messed up thing that shouldn't be going on. It still continues to this day. It's not a conspiracy theory. There's like data around that stuff. Mm-hmm. And so um, I think, you know, his... You know, at, at the end of the day, I think him and, and, and those who are closest around him seem to be making the case for, you know, how government is useless and how government can't um, really protect you or serve you in that way. And because of that, government must be shrunken. But before they do that, they will make sure they get their cut of the pie. So where it's corporate tax write-offs or, or whether it's just like softening, you know, uh, you know dot frank. Um, they're going to make sure that, you know, before they, before they, they, they leave the, the kitchen barren, they're going to make sure that they get something. And, and, and the problem is increasingly, uh, and that's why these, these, these midterm elections are so important, um, you know, the truth is that if, if, you know, Trump and his cabinet of, you know, of folks who really don't want to actually do their jobs, um, those folks are going to leave you know, going to leave the, the you know, the, it's just going to leave it barren. I mean, look at the effect that Rex Tillerson had on the State Department, hmm. right? Dying this week. Generational um, impact. Generational. You know, I mean, the, the number of diplomats that have left um, or whose careers have been tarnished just because of sheer mere presence or, or his, both either both his presence or his just, you know, his inability to do the job and, and, and be... Um, and be what people needed, which is a statesman around the world, right? I mean, that's just, I mean, imagine that. And, he, and some are, would argue that he was actually half-decent, right? Or at least came in with a half-decent resume, right? I mean, we haven't even talked about Rick Perry at EPA or okay. even, you know, sessions in, in the Justice well, Department. Well, ben, uh, ben Carson with his $31,000 dining room set. You know, no, it's it's a uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a cabin of deplorables. The, the other the piece I wanted to note on this um you know, as it relates to like immigration and sort of law enforcement and prioritizing, because of course he's blaming, you know, uh, he's in the context of cartels and all the drug problems of West Virginians and New Hampshireites and Mainers and Ohioans has nothing to do with pharmaceutical industry, nothing to do with 
with uh, you know pharma. It has, you know, it's it's just it's Mexicans, you know, flooding our communities with drugs. Um, that you know, in London this week, Albert Prime Minister Theresa May announced they've expelled twenty three Russian diplomats after the poisoning of former Russian spy um, Sergei Skripal and his daughter. Um, and it's interesting because the juxtaposition, a juxtaposition of Great Britain actually focusing their their law enforcement resources on the the bad actors that are actually here to do us harm. You know, when I see ICE in that video in Southern California, it was actually in the San Diego area. Uh, I'm sure you saw it, LB, of a woman literally getting, you know, walking her three teenage daughters down the block, uh, uh, you know, going to a friend's house or a relative's house, just, you know, going among their daily lives. And three unar- un- un- unidentified guys who are ICE agents really grab her and throw her in the back of a van and leave her daughters alone. Um, when I see those those resources done for harm unnecessarily, and I see on the flip side Great Britain, who by the way cops don't even walk around with guns, or just recently started doing so, and they have virtually no these sort of incidents, actually focusing their law enforcement resources on the in this case Russian diplomats who are here to do harm. And I've said this, I've seen you've seen me post it on social media. I spent a fair amount of time in Washington, D.C. And I'm not trying to be funny, and it's certainly nothing to do with, I love my Russian peoples. You know me, Al, but you know us, how much love we got for Russians. Um, but in this case, the diplomatic community, the the the, the people that are part of the the, comp, the Putin's people are all over the place in D.C. <laughs> and it's like, you know, why don't we spend the resources on the people that are here to do us harm? And, you know, I would argue are practically, you know, controlling our country. Um, so, but we know the answer to that. But no, we're going to we're going to waste all kind of money, all kind of resources uh, to divide our community, tear families apart. You know, a mother comes in with a small child. We're going to separate her and, uh, you know, once she gets into this country. So there's a lot of sad things going on, a lot of money being raised. Like, I mean, ultimately, this Nobody. is the thing, right? Exactly. And, and this is, you know, it's funny, like, you know, you, you know, we're, you know, a couple of weeks removed from, you know, uh, the great Black Panther movie. Um, you Wakanda, know, I, I, I baby. call up my, my Marvel Studios, you know, I call up my Marvel Studios, you know, movie things to look at, you know, Captain America Civil War and, and look at the fact that, like, sometimes, you know, it, it, it's ironic because the thing that should be bringing us together, right, the, you know, in terms of the ability, you know, the, the American ideal, in terms of democracy and, like, people wanting to come together and, you know, and, and, and the idea of, even though we all have all these different kind of cultures that we all share some actual ideals together, right? Like, it's up strengthening that, right? And strengthening, like, again, family values and, and, and the idea of, of, of creating um, spaces and places where people can succeed and, 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 and do what they're meant to do. Instead of doing that, what well, all this does is just it, it just continues to divide people. And, 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 and it makes ICE, for better or for worse, seem like just some high-tech bullies, right? Some high-tech bullies. Like, I mean, dag, not even in some places, like, where, where people could argue about, like, cops being bad. I, I've, never seen a, I've never seen a cop just leave a kid, like, randomly. Like, I mean, think about it. I mean, like, and again, whether they're doing that in California um, or whether they're stopping people in Greyhound buses up in Florida, right, just randomly, like, they're grabbing folks. Like, that's not, that's not what, what, that's not makes people feel safe. Right, but it does encourage like fear, and it does encourage people not to say anything. Um, and you know, and, and, and it pits people against each other. I mean, look, that's why the guy, the ICE spokesman, resigned in California, right? Because he couldn't deal with it, right? But that's how many right. other people are living and working under that stress and all that? And fear? now, with the courts, uh, the, uh, the 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 state, the federal courts um, letting SB four move forward in Texas, you're going to have literally 40% of the population, if not more that are going to live in this fear, because essentially we're all suspected of being undocumented and we could be stopped and we could be, you know, not allowed to go to college. I mean, there's all kind of, it's just going to expand the fear, expand the terror. And by the way, not coincidentally that the Democrats are going to be on their uh, Ted Cruz's heels and the, and the Republicans heels in the fall. So how can we slow down this movement of young, you know, this young Latino population that's, that's forging a new mode. Well, let's scare the shit out of them and, you know, you know, and have them live in this constant state of fear. Um, but we're not going to stand also, for that, you know? And I was going to say that this fear, though, has a price tag, right? Like, this fear is not just mm. random, Ray, right? That's I right. mean, it, it's interesting, right, that for all his talk, right, and all of it says, 
you know, deportations did not increase, you know, at the end of 2017, but incarceration did, right? Mm -hmm. And who's actually, like, are they being incarcerated in public prisons and stuff? A lot of them are being, tar are being, are being, incar are being held, and held in some cases because the Supreme Court has said they can be held without cause, right, in private prisons, right? And in places where, like, and, and so you have to also, we have to begin to look at, to look at the money, right, and to look at who is actually benefiting, because there are folks who are benefiting from this um, this climate of fear, right, and, it, it, and 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 we have to like really not lose sight of that. And again, it takes some some intrepid reporting, some investigative reporting that, to, to to connect the dots. But in some ways, in some places, like people aren't even being shy anymore about this stuff, right? I mean, Sessions himself has like you know stocks. In terms oh, yeah. of some of these private, yeah, he's, he's you know, benefiting private from corporations like the Geo Group and these other That's things. right. And by the way, by the way, he he's he's gonna. <laughs> this is the bottom line on on sessions on one point with incarceration. He will always focus on the hard drugs and not pot. He's talking about the pot stuff, but the bottom line is he won't do that because that puts white people in prison. So you know, there's there's just a lot of saber rattling here. And you're absolutely right. You're listening to Obi Garcia on Race Talk Show again. Check out Race Talk Show anywhere you can download the podcast iTunes, Stitcher, um, email us at podcastraise at gmail.com. We're having an excellent conversation here with Elbert and earlier in the in the show, Marisa Bel Torres. Wanted to pick your brain on politics, Elbert. This is my concern. Of course, we're happy that in Pennsylvania 18, our homie Steve Kornacki, you talk about must-see political television, uh, was able to announce in the wee hours on Wednesday morning that um, Connor Lamb, the Democrat, um, uh, was able to win in that special election in Western Pennsylvania, beating Riss Lomas Sacon, um, uh, and uh, by a narrow margin. Uh, my concern with this race, Albert, I want to get your take on it, is that the a lot of the political wisdom from the Morning Joe crowd and other even Democratic pundits was that you see. You can't, you know, it's not about being a Bernie Sanders Democrat or a quote-unquote progressive Democrat. It's about being, you know, sort of fitting the district. And, you know, Democrats need to have a big tent. And while there's some truth to that, and obviously you have to have a, a candidate that, 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 that has a feel for the district, and you just need strong candidates across the board and real people. But my concern with that, LB, is that, and I've seen Democrats make this mistake before, is that they're going to try to play it real safe, I remember them doing this to some degree in 2006, if you recall. They, you know, they kept they they pushed uh, Rahm Emanuel was pushing a lot of very moderate conservative Democrats in some of these swing districts to run, and I'm starting to see that with some of the candidates in some of these districts, particularly in the Northeast, in New Jersey, in New York State, and in Pennsylvania, um, is that they're going to want to play it safe and very moderate, if not conservative, Democrats, when in fact that might be you know in certain instances uh, necessary, but for the most part. The Democratic base and the people that are riled up right now, like those young people, like immigrant activists, like the people that are engaged in the Puerto Rico issue, which is not going away, unfortunately, all these other issues that we that we deal with on a daily basis, Albert, um, you know, we want real leadership that has the courage of their convictions and not people that are going to hide behind orthodoxy. That's been, frankly, the problem with the Democratic Party for years, um, that they've played it too safe um, and you can argue too corporately influenced. So, Albert, do you see that concern? Do you see that dynamic? Um, something we have to look out for? And um, what do you think the Democrats, how do the Democrats balance practicality in winning elections with uh, being who we are and, or who we should be, which is inspirational, courageous, uh, and, and progressive? I mean, I, I think, I mean, a lot of it, you know, depends on, you know, depends on the state parties, right? And I think that, Look, I mean, to win in Pittsburgh or that northern, you know, that 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 northwest part of Pennsylvania. I mean, people have known for years what it takes to win up there, right? And what folks are, and people are. Um, I think that I think it's about consistency. And the real question is that, like, is there a consistency um, that can stretch from you know the suburbs of Pittsburgh, you know, to the you know you know to the you know to the to the streets of Kendall and Liberty City here in Florida, right? Like, do you actually have what it takes? Now, I will say this, um, you know, the Florida Democratic Party is in a different shape than the Pennsylvania um, Democratic Party, right? Um, or at least it remains to be seen whether or not, um, you know, the Pennsylvania folks can, can, can fub up stuff 
um, you know, as they did. I mean, I mean, let's be real. I mean, this is a Democratic Party in Florida that left Marco Rubio last year, right? Um, and, and, and everybody, I mean, I mean, it's just like that's just you know. I hate you, bro. Thing, bro. And <laughs> yeah. so, um, and again, who a left party that has to like pay his hopes on Senator twice, Nelson? Right? And I had um, an interesting conversation with him a few weeks ago in DC, but that's another story. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. No, but so I mean, but I do think it's like you know, I, I think this is the problem, right? I think this is the problem sometimes with these state parties, you know, with the state parties too. Is that like you look at, for example, Virginia, and the way in which helping to center the candidates, um, you know, along the concerns of folks of color and the folks who not only are traditionally people who come out, but who also need a reason to come out. Right? And that ultimately is what, you know, party politics is about, right? To a certain degree, sometimes the other, you know, peop- it, it, you know, sometimes people don't lose elections. People just fail to win them, right? And, and, and I think sometimes people think, you know, oh, Repub- Republicans will lose elections because of who's on the top of the ticket. But that's not how local elections are run, right? I mean, we'll talk about 2020 at some other point, but at least for 2018, we're talking about, Local elections. We're talking about governor elections. We're talking about your 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 states and your and your representatives. And ultimately, people want to people want to vote for somebody, not against somebody, right? And so, I think the question is: is that can the Democrats, you know, do the Democrats have a vision for leading America, right? And do they have mm. a vision for leading America that has folks of color at the center, right, and creating decisions, right? And when folks question it, say, no, these two are Americans, right? That there are that, that Puerto Ricans are citizens both on the mainland and on the island. And so we will actually are we will actually push forward things that create opportunities for folks and that will also safeguard rights, right? And I think you can have, I think politically speaking, from a political standpoint, you can have some um, some stretching when it comes to like people specific. Um, you know, views on like, you know, perhaps guns and stuff. Um, but there are some basic core fundamental rights that, you know, Democrats shouldn't be afraid to say that that's what they believe in. Um, because I will, th- I, will, I will say, at least in the state of Florida, that the reason for a lot of people not turning out in 2016 was the lack of that vision and the lack of speaking to those real bread and butter issues. Well, and it goes, that's issues right. and the it goes, same, mm-hmm. I, think, I think, from a lot of people regardless of whether or not they're rural folks or they're in the urban city. No, I agree. And and the thing is, it is about listening. And one of the things that, and again, this goes back to this, my concern is that, you know, there's going to be this, this um, there's going to be a temptation, especially when there's so many of these uh, Republican districts in place, um, in play now, because there's 100 districts that are less Republican than the one that, the one that uh, Connor Lamb won in a few days ago, um, is that, You know, it is about listening and talking about issues that really are resonating at the core of people's concerns. So when I think about in 2016, in many ways, this was the uh, the reason, one of the dominant reasons for Bernie Sanders and Trump's successes in their elect in their campaigns, because Bernie, when he was talking about, you know, student debt um, and, you know, um, you know, that impacts two generations of college graduates and aspiring college students and people that are getting an education. And so. You know things that are at the core of where people are at um, in their in their anxieties. Trump, you know, kind of dealing with kind of the the older working class white whiter um, you know set of anxieties around the the changes of the global economy and sort of where culturally I I fit in 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 twenty in a in a modern America in a modern world as a as a you know as a cornball from the Midwest who maybe um, is having you know has economic secure insecurities and cultural insecurities, you know, we, we may not um, believe that we have answers for those concerns, but we certainly don't touch on them when we sort of give the same sort of generic democratic uh, talking points um, because it doesn't sound like we're listening. Um, and, and, and our leadership being such creatures of Washington, um, and again, I generally like these people. I was with uh, both Senator Schumer and Nancy Pelosi doing activities, collaborating the last few weeks. So it's not that I have anything personally against them, but they do represent sort of a generation um, that are creatures of Washington. And so they can respond to that because Bernie Sanders is a creature of Washington um, over the last 20 years. But unlike them, uh, what when when Bernie's been speaking about these issues and even someone like Trump speaking about these issues, 
you can you get a sense that they're they're sort of hitting the nerves uh, that are moving this country um, and not just talking political talking points, which, again, we may agree on those policies and generally believe in these people's uh, capacity to lead and move legislation. But it's not inspiring people. And that's my biggest concern. We have to continue to inspire people for something optimistic, because if we don't inspire people to believe um, that things can really change in a positive way, then we, we're not going to be successful in November. We're not going to be successful as political movements because um, then we're going to get into the same dynamic that took place in 2016 and what Donald, through Donald Trump's trying to propagate, which is this concept that, you know, well, nothing's really going to change and all these people are full of shit. Um, well, so, you and know. again, Ray, the reason why Trump wins in 2016, I mean, again, there's, you know, you know I, I will always push back against the general narrative. People want to be like, oh, you know, Democrats lost because they lost the white vote. No, the Democrats lost because yeah, less people the came out to vote. Because at the end of the day, regardless of whether it was at the top of the ticket or whether it's the middle of the ticket, you know, in a Senate race like in Florida where you had Murphy versus Rubio, at the end of the day, less people came out to vote, right? Donald Trump pretty much got the same amount of votes for the people to come out, to come out for him, than Mitch Romney did, and Mitt Romney did, right? Pretty much it's the same. But the problem for, for Hillary or the Democrats at that point is that less people came out, right? And mind you, that's the same thing, that's the same dynamic you saw years ago, decades ago, when David Dinkins lost to Rudy Giuliani in the second go-around, right, in 1993, right? It wasn't that New York City has shifted to suddenly become more Republican, right? But something between what was going on, between even just in terms of the excitement of the race, people didn't come out. And Democrats can't win or, or can't win elections that have some real substantial, um, a real substantial kick. They can't lead a, a movement or a wave, a sustaining wave, if they cannot inspire people and expand their base. And that, that's a tough pill from a political standpoint because it means that you actually have to spend more money, right? And the real question is, are Democrats really, um, are, are they that invested in, 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 in getting different folks from different places to actually come out and, and vote. And you know what's, I, so, f- and what's you know? so frustrating about it, LB, is that, and I get frustrated, and it's another conversation for another time, but I think about, you know, kind of the Castro brothers in Texas. So, you know, I love them. We have the same uh, uh, political mentor, Andy Hernandez, and, you know, I mean, we've, we've, we've been honored to follow their, you know, their, their success has inspired us, but at the same time, they're playing it very safe, you know, you know, uh, um, you know, uh, Joaquin's not running against Cruz, and you know they're sort of biding their time for another opportunity. But I think it's so, someone like Beto O'Rourke. Shout out to him. You know, he went to college. We went to undergrad with with Beto. Um, who, you know, basically he's throwing himself in this, and he's not doing anything particularly con- uh, complicated. He's listening. He's campaigning vigorously. He's going into uh, urban areas and 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 you know, red the reddest parts of Texas. He's listening, and he probably won't win. I mean, it's it's hard to make up half a million votes in six months, but he's going to make a good run at it. He's going to come out of it politically stronger. And I don't think there's any great, you know, ideological or, you know, he doesn't have any great uh, vision for, you know, uh, revitalizing things. He's listening to people and he's being uh, open about who he is and and what his what his ideas are, even though, again, it's so it's not about sort of the the nuances of a vision of this incredible policy, but it does sound like someone that's listening to the the people he's he's trying to earn their vote from, um, and uh, you know again Castro brothers playing it safe, kind of having a you know kind of doing this in a different way, but um, you know I just wish that we would take and even if he loses and he, good chance he will, he's going to win and we're going to win because it'll move the ball forward for us in Texas and. And I just think about that woman, uh, what's her first name, Abrams, that's running in Georgia. Oh, my. If it, if it wasn't for race, that woman would ruin the landslide. She still might win. Um, but right. just because she's African-American, there's a, a question. That woman is, is that woman could be president of the United States. She would make a great president. She's so incredible. Um, and so we've got to have those kind of leaders. And, and, again, it's like you said earlier. How do we empower the people that are really are the leadership of the Democratic Party? And the leaders clearly are among amongst the top leaders of this party uh, are African American women. So how do we empower women like that uh, and others around the country uh, because they are 
you know, they've been the ones carrying our water for so much time. Every time Senator Jones from Alabama does something against our communities, I just want to strangle them because, I mean, you know, I mean, again, uh, uh, another candidate who's not listening to the people that brought him to the uh, that brought him to victory. Um, and so and, and so we're going to be frustrated by these. Con- and it, but it's very important conversations. And we look forward to continue to have these conversations with leaders like I know you listened last week, Albert, but um, uh, the leaders I had on the show, Christina Zinzun from Texas uh, and Ivan Gutierrez, Latinas representing in Texas, um, really brought some very provocative thoughts around this area. And we're going to continue to bring folks uh, like that onto the show um before we get out of here real quick note i know people um are still very heavily engaged as i am as albert is in uh uh, on the continual crisis that's happening on the island of puerto rico and the crisis of the displaced population um a big chunk of the island who is now relocated to the mainland united states we are in the process of working with some of the top activists both here and on the island of Puerto Rico, to have a, a, a few shows dedicated just to that subject. So listen out. My Puerto Rican activists like, yo, Ray, you ain't talking about Puerto Rico most lately. Um, it is definitely top of mind. So we're just, we just want to create uh, some themes around those shows, and we're going to really want to dive into it very deeply because there's many issues uh, related to that. And lo siento a nuestra familia en Puerto Rico que todavía sin luce, seis meses después el huracán. Unbelievable. Um, so we have to stay, um, you know, pendiente and and, uh, and advocate for our families and friends. Um, on a sad note, Albert, but, you know, we have to celebrate the lives of these people. I wanted to make sure we had a moment to just reflect on the lives of some people we lost this week. Uh, first of all, and I re- re- referenced them early in the show, Anthony Stephen House and Draylon Mason were the two gentlemen um, that were killed. Um, and it was actually an older, an elderly Latina that was injured by these these package bomb attacks um you know in austin texas over the last week or so um both you know anthony and draylon were pillars of the community draylon was actually a very talented high school senior musician he was a bassist um, who had just gotten accepted into the ut austin's exclusive music program so just extremely tragic and as uh, sean king and others have been documenting on social media it seems very suspicious um, it seems like it's pretty likely these are racially motivated attacks, so we have to hold the Austin uh, uh, police accountable to getting to the bottom of this. The other, one, Another uh, sad loss this week in uh, Latin America was a Rio de Janeiro city councilwoman named Mariel Franco, a groundbreaking Afro-Brazilian LGBT politician who had become uh, a voice of the favelas, in Rio de Janeiro and essentially was the most visible leader of the Brazilian Black Lives Matter movement. They don't call it that, but essentially an awareness to raise around policing and uh, the issues of poverty that impact the Afro-Brazilian and the poorest communities of Rio de Janeiro, which are very much, uh, you know, unfortunately very much centered in the black community in, in Rio and in Brazil. I know that Albert, you know, it's interesting that we're having She's, she was leading these conversations in Brazil around race, class, law enforcement, and poor communities. And in the midst of this, we're having the same conversations very much in the United States. And people like, I want to give a shout out to Amara La Negra, Afro-Dominicana, who's very much leading the conversation of colorism and, 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 and racial disparities within the, Af- and, and within the Latinx community. So I know, but these are conversations you and I have been talking about a long time. And uh, we're very sad to hear about Counselor Franco's loss. No, definitely, definitely very sad. I also want to kind of say, also sad, I think you know, we, in the last week or so, we also saw, lost Joaquin Avila, who was a pioneering voting rights attorney. Oh, yes, um, yes. You know, uh, and, and who helped basically write, you know, in, in terms of the California legislature, you know, helped uh, to write their, you know, their, their civil rights, um, you know, law, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, civil rights, uh, you know, law, you know, law bill up there. Um, and so really kind of a real pioneer in terms of, um, you know, working through different organizations, I, I think, including MALDEF. Um, so just kind of real shout out to that because, because, because there was, especially in the voting rights community, there was definitely a moment in a pause of silence because he was someone that, that had done a bunch of things for, for, you know, died of cancer at the age of 69. Um, again, a, a young, um, you know, young in terms of relative term, um, to, you know, in terms of one of our leaders and, and, and you know, leaders working behind the scenes. Um, maybe not known in, in sort of like huge circles, but in the circles where stuff is done, um, certainly kind of, you know, that, that, that kind of felt. 
Yeah, no, and uh, Maria Franco, the Rio de Janeiro City Council, was actually assassinated, basically, in her car with a driver who was also killed, um, Pedro Gomez, and um, and just really tragic. So we we hope that we can find justice in that case. Um, and uh, it's really been uh, it's really struck a nerve with the with with many Brazilian leaders and and Afro Latino activists uh, throughout the diaspora. It's 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 interesting that this uh, these conversations on race have really percolated over the last several years in Brazil, um, sort of in somewhat parallel fashion with the United States. So recently, there's been a conversation over the last few months over uh, Musica Urbana reggaeton star Anita, um, who's, a, who's a Brazilian artist. And, you know, basically her latest video, she was wearing, you know, braids, dreadlocks. Um, and uh, there was many Afro-Brazilian artists that were questioning her. Um, you know, was this a, a cultural appropriation um, even though, you know, she's she's a, you know, mestiza or uh, a, a, what we may consider a biracial Brazilian. And so in some, uh, you know, sort of black intellectual circles this week on online, there were similar conversations happening about Bruno Mars, uh, the, the Puerto Rican uh, Filipino megastar who obviously does a lot of soul soul music in his in his artistry. And so, you know, is, is Bruno Mars culturally appropriating uh, black music and so well that's another conversation and we should have that co- we will have that conversation on the show but i just wanted to note that whether it's in latin america or in the mainland united states these are issues that and again i want to i want to credit amara negra for really kind of bringing this ep- this question to the floor here amongst our community and, and we have to engage these these uh, issues head on yeah no and, and i think you know i think part of the problem and look there, there's an active conversation around anti-blackness in the you know the Latino and Latinx you know community that 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 folks are leading and that's important. I think sometimes what happens is that, especially in certain parts of the country, you know Latinos are used to being racialized and being um, thought of in terms of that way that um, that they forget that that's an actual you know, that 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 just because our status, especially in some cities, um, of being um, you know, of being discriminated or racialized doesn't mean that 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 stops us from doing the work of actually checking our own, um, you know, checking our own privilege and checking our own, um, you know, our own history, you know, our own histories there. And 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 to be fair, this is a discussion, and I go back to especially into the, the work that we do with our youth. You know, this is a discussion around a lot of education that a lot of people just don't know, right? A lot of people don't mm-hmm. know. I mean, like, mm-hmm. and, and and in terms of across. You know, cultures, right? Don't know about that, um, and so it's it, it, it's a conversation um, that that folks have to have because in many of this country, the legacy of white supremacy, whether directly because of from the slave trade or because of U.S. occupation, um, you know, early in the 19th century, um, has hidden a lot of that stuff, right? I mean, you have, you know, for example, especially you've seen in terms of years, especially in the last 10 years, you know, Mexico coming to grips with its own. Um, Afro Mexicano like legacy, right? Um, and and the important role that in fact that Mexico actually played in um, in terms of uh, in terms of the anti slavery efforts, um, you know, in the the late nineteenth century is something that people also forget, you know. And so again, there, there's a there's a there's a professor out of I think Florida State, Paul Ortiz, who recently dropped the book. Um, about the like the intersection of, of black and Latinx movements, right? And a lot of what he talks about is that this this solidarity between black and brown folks that people think it's just has happened just because of the '60s, or at least it's something that's happened post New Deal, is actually a lot longer than people think, right? Um, and yet, even if you have that history of working together in solidarity, it doesn't necessarily absolve you from checking your 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 own issues, right? And so, Absolutely. big shout out to folks who are really kind of um, having the courage to have these conversations, lead those conversations, because shaking people from, from their comfort levels um, is certainly not an easy. Thing. I would encourage people. You're absolutely right about that, and particularly in the Latinx community, there's a lot of young people that are really sort of millennial generation, are really pushing these conversations. And there was a uh, check out if people get a chance ha- the hashtag Central American Twitter. Um, there's a lot of young Central Americans <laughs> based in the Southwest that are having some very interesting conversations. Uh, with their Mexican American brothers and sisters out in Southwest, because uh, they feel that they're they're uh, they're more African, potentially African influenced cultures from Central America, and, and uh, even they're more um, they feel they're even their indigenous 
uh, backgrounds. You know, their particular culture isn't fully represented in the conversations around the Latinx community in Southern California and other other communities where there's large, both large Mexican American and Central American communities. So there's a lot of interesting conversations going on, and we're going to continue to have those conversations here on Ray's talk show. The last shout out, man, this one hit me hard. I know it did for you too, Albert. Craig Mack passed away. Craig Mack, uh, the man that really busted the door open for the bad boy movement, uh, uh, potentially the greatest one-hit wonder in hip-hop history, Flavor in Year. If you didn't ever rock the Flavor in Year in your life, you ain't living. Craig Mack uh, probably would have had a longer or more prolific career, I should say, uh, but turned to Christianity many years ago. And, uh, you know, so that's why you didn't see him in these old school hip-hop tours and, and uh, you know, just had been, just been living a much more... Uh, 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 was enjoying a life of living uh, of with his faith and, and quietly in, in Southern Cal- in South Carolina. Forty six years old, Albert. I know this had to hit you hard, man. Was, I mean, that, were, that well, you and I were roaming the streets in New York in the nineties when Craig Mack was popping back in the days. Yeah, man. I mean, people, you know, people forget. Like, you know, the remixes where you know where mm-hmm. Biggie coined that famous mm-hmm. line, you know, about you know, mm-hmm. don't be mad, mm-hmm. UPS is hiring. You know, like that. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm. that's coming off the remix, right? But mm. even people forget, like, mm. even before the remix, you know, mm. Flemmy in general was mm. just kind of doing it that way. It, mm. You know, it's bad because we are seeing a generation mm. of folks, mm. uh, you know, folks who we, you know, we grew up with just like dying, right? Oh and they God, dying God, early. I mean, dying Rick, of, like, dude, thank God Rick Ross made it. Like, I, over <laughs> last weekend, I was freaking out. I'm like, we're not going to lose Rick, the boss. My God, it's so scary. So scary, yeah. Craig Mack. Rest in peace, Craig Mack. You know the other thing about guys say about Craig Mack is Craig Mack used to get clowned for years in the hip hop circles for not being the most attractive brother, and he took it like with a lot of style and grace and finesse. Never had a beef with anybody. I mean, he just rolled with the punches. Always was respected, lyricist, good guy. Um, everybody. I mean, all the real hip hop heads from that generation, from Fat Joe to obviously you know everyone from the Bad Boy universe. Um, you know anyone that collaborated with Craig Mack gave him a lot of love. So rest in peace, Craig. You know, you always are a big part of the family. Thank you all so much for listening to Ray's Talk Show. Albert, anything else? I know there's always stuff going on in Florida. Anything else before we wrap up this episode of Ray's Talk Show? It's been a great episode, brother. I've missed you so much. Um, I, anything else you, you know, wanted to shout out or anything else about what your great work in well, Florida? I think, I, I think, you know, Florida is, uh, I mean, I think everyone has a lot of attention on Florida because, uh, you know, if you can uh, push, if you can push, you know, if you can build a bench, a progressive bench in Florida, then that gives a lot of hope for the rest of the you're going to be seeing, I think, a lot of folks, especially in the springtime, working on voter registration, whether it's working, you know, working to the young folks, trying to turn this gun um, activism into some real holding folks accountable. Um, and you're going to also see a lot of folks in terms of trying to target, you know, Central Florida and Puerto Ricans. And, 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 and there, I know you're going to have another episode about, about what's going on in terms of there. Um, you know, my concern is, is what happens, you know, when folks are kind of stuck in the middle. I've, I've known, I've, you know, I've talked to a bunch of folks who, have come to Florida thinking that it's the land of, of where they can rebuild and finding that it's just not the bilingual place that they want, you know? Um, and then they end up, and, and so they then go back to, to Puerto Rico almost like with unknown. And there's definitely folks who are kind of stuck in the middle. They don't want to be on the island, um, but they don't know if actually this country even wants them. So um, that's a tough, you know, place to be. Um, but shout out to all those folks working with those communities. Uh, shout out to our sister Ivelisse Rodriguez who's coming out with a new book. Absolutely, um, you, she will be coming on the show. One of our great, uh, one of our great write- authors and friends. She'll be coming and, on the show. And shout out to some, you know, some new. I think some new poetry that they covered of Julio de Burgos. Um, yes. That's the that the Centro okay. for uh, Puerto Studies in in New York um, recently unearthed. So, uh, shout out to to those folks always who are. Uh, but really kind of uncovering history and making sure that we don't forget. So I'm glad you brought up Eva I give my shout out. To I, no, I appreciate you giving Eva Lee that love and well deserved. She's been getting her book, who's it's not even published yet, it's getting a lot of buzz. I've seen it already on a lot of go to list of authors uh, for 2018. So she'll be on the show. I've already reached out to her. A great friend of the show, Patty Rodriguez, who's very well known and uh, around the country, uh, collaborates uh, in the media with Ryan Seacrest in his radio program and does a lot of other things, an author. She just came out with a children's book, a bilingual children's book about the life of Selena. Um, who uh, is like and popping. shout out to Juno, Juno with his, with his children's book. Yes, um, yes, so the know? writers, we, I'm glad you brought that up. We definitely have to dedicate some time to to giving our writers and our authors some love, um, and they're, they're doing <laughs> a lot a really of exciting good, things. That sounds like an episode in the making. 
making there, you know? That's, oh, that's, um, that sounds, sounds like a series. It's actually its own podcast, frankly. There's so that. many there's so many good writers. I would love to, you know, a Juno Ray Elbert like sit down over a uh, a little Brugal is is definitely overdue. I think it's about fifteen years overdue. It's almost happened a couple times. That's all their story. Our brother, my brother, Michael Yasso and, and Juno say, are homies, I think, I think and Doug Yasso Chavez like, and those guys, yeah, Dario Collado, all those cats. Those are those are Juno's young boys. So, and they're our young guys. So we uh, we have a lot of good collab. There's a lot of collaborating going on there. Well, well, Albert, thank you so much, brother. Again, for people that uh, enjoyed this episode, like and review us on social and on iTunes. Download the episode, subscribe on iTunes, anywhere you can download a podcast. We get a lot of love on Spotify from our listeners and SoundCloud, YouTube, everywhere. Thank you so much. Albert, uh, give a hug to the family, and uh, and you'll be back. Uh, it certainly won't be. Uh, the, I'm not going to give you this kind of hiatus, brother. You know, you, you know, you, this ain't Netflix, dog. You need, to, you need to work for your money here, brother. But thank you again. I, I know I got you last second, and, and we'll keep these conversations going for sure. Sounds like a plan, Ray. You have a good night. You too.